I'm actually a professor by virtue of uh, my industrial design practice. So even though I am forced to write journal papers, which is a bit like turning my head inside out, I'm actually a practitioner. So I've started this um, presentation talking about what I have done and what I do do in order to contextualize what I want to share from complex system science and how that relates to what I do currently, which is digital transformation design, which is effectively user experience on steroids, I think. Well, I'll also share with you, I'm in the middle of a big private job that's in a constant pivot, and I've pointed out if it's a constant pivot, it's not a pivot, it's chaos. I've inherited, um, a twen there's 20 to 30 million quids worth of investment behind this project, and at the minute it's what I've described as a block of flats. And I've said if we go live with this block of flats, it's just gonna sink like a stone. It's a massive database with a little bit of a front end on every bit of functionality, on every bit of data content. So suffice to say, I'm a human-centered designer and I'm interested in how human beings behave as part of human systems. And in a minute, hopefully, I'll have a picture. That's the wrong PowerPoint. Hang on. That's right. This is because of Apple's new bloody um, socket. It is. I used to buy my equipment based on how many inputs and outputs it had, because that shows you a good piece of equipment. No comment, Apple. I have actually, um, I don't do much teaching anymore, I just do research and enterprise, but I did write and run um, three UX master's courses at Kingston, and I think there's at least one of my spawn in the room. Is that correct? Oh, two. Was it any good? Thanks. <laughs> That's the really right time to say that. <laughs> yeah, that was actually a fascinating process. Because we had to, and it relates to what I'm going to talk about, because we had to converge from across computing, from technological science and engineering, from arts and from design and media studies, and it took us a year to try and pull everything together into what should actually be in a UX master's course. And I think that's what's so fascinating about this area, because you, you almost have these problems um, trying to get through to people why we need to do things the way that we need to do them. And hopefully this will point you in the direction of some, um, some well-argued parameters for why we need to do things the way we need to do them. Okay, so my, I design complex systems. There's been a lot of talk this morning about what complexity is and whether you can manage it or predict it. Some of us have the god-awful task of trying to design these things. And I think most of you in the room probably do too. So I am um, three days a week professor and two days a week as a design consultant which is just really to emphasize the fact that I'm a practitioner. I'm also um, a professor of digital transformation design, which is something I've made up over the last 25 years, so I'm really good at it. Um, I'm the academic lead on the Brighton Catapult Center, and I'm also the academic lead on Connected Futures, which is one of five new research themes for the University of Brighton. So what is digital transformation design? It's a digital first, design-led, user-centered industrial method for engineering transformation of complex human-centered uh, systems. And they are things like multi-platform global marketing campaigns, large organizational infrastructures that may, of course, be across different geographical locations, multi-platform markets and distributed economies with the R missing, and uh, virtual worlds and simulations. And the, things that all these th the, the, the attributes that all these things have in common is that they're all about large groups of people trying to do things. So there's a lot of commonalities in there, which I think in this room you probably understand. Um, I'm also a Generation X digital grandma, and I say this because I'm likely to swear, but I feel after, the pre after Jerry, he's giving me quite a good warm-up <laughs> if I suddenly drop the F-bomb. I work with a lot of millennials who look at me like, what is wrong with this potty mouth woman? Sorry, it's a generational thing. And also, I describe myself as a digital grandma, and people go, oh, no, you're not. Yeah, I am. And it's all right. I'm all right of being the age that I am. You know, we don't. Ha Why is that a negative term? I'm a digital grandma. So yeah, my first website was in '94. Touch screen the same time. I got EU recognition for the micro business model, outsourcing everything by ISDN off a Power Mac 8500 in '96. I did a live locative game using MIDI and data gloves. Some AI that was a bit like the, the sort of her movie. 
Uh, the, I worked on one of the first ever pan-European websites, and when we suddenly realized it had to be in 12 languages, it was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I think that's a, a good time to use the F-bomb. And then also things like interactive television. Someone was saying before about whether you do things that uh, have not... I only do things that have not been done before. And I do that in industry, in academia, or in my shed or whatever. I'm interested in doing things that haven't been done before. And I go wherever that innovation curve is going. So I sort of go in and out. In 98, we had people coming in and asking about interactive television, and no one had ever done it before. And I said, well, why don't we charge them to work out what they want and what the requirements are and what we can do? Lo and behold, that's what designers would do anyway, but it became formalized as part of Sprint Zero and went on to be part of Fulcrum at Havas Worldwide as through conglomeration. I've since, as I was Googling yesterday, realized it's gone, which is a shame because I was quite proud of that contribution. Um, so there was a lot of scope for innovation in process as well as in product. My technical experience includes bloody all sorts. I like machines. I started playing with machines as a teenager. Um, Recently, I've been working a lot with um, converged biometric data inputs. I've been working on neuromarketing and neurogaming. And uh, my research at the minute is on cognitive and sentient systems, which I'll touch on at the end. My, my skill set's um, agnostic, as probably most of yours is. And I've worked across public, private, and third sectors, listed all there. And you'll notice there's a gap in the logos, and that's for the national and international security and defense stuff. <laughs> Suffice to say, there's a, lot, there's a lot of places where we need to bring our skill set. And that we can solve hugely important problems by taking our skill set into these places. And I'm sure that as, our, as, as things unpack and people understand the purpose of what we do, we'll be much more um, employable and our rates will go up. So, this is what I do, and I'm sure lots of you do it too. I simultaneously design and build digital artifacts, develop digital production methods, establish digital business management and migrational mod migration models, and devise transformational strategies. Because very often this all goes together. Because I'm going into situations with huge legacy systems who want to create huge changes. We all know what happens to companies that don't create those changes. So at the minute it's all about trying to help large organizations pivot. So that, without question, is complex. It's also complicated, and I want to talk about the difference. So to, we can actually define complexity. I'm not, I'm not actually an expert um, in complexity science, but I've had the honor of working with people who are. I'm just a designer, and I use whatever I can to make things work. So is something complex, or is it complicated? In popular dialogues, it's often used to, as a point of resignation, saying it can't, a system cannot be sufficiently described, predicted, or managed, such as transport networks, management infrastructure, supply chain logistics. Is it complex or messy? In the social sciences, it's used to talk about intricate, involved, complicated, multidimensional, interconnected systems, such as citizenship, identity, overlapping geographies, and competing histories. Fascinating graphic on immigration um, between different countries. We've hardly got any, and all the fuss is about, anyway. So, I'm here really to say, complex system science is a thing, and lots of people far more intelligent than I have been here before us, telling us what that thing is, and telling us how complex systems work, and I use what I've learnt in my design practice. It's evolved, it's evolved, it's very interdisciplinary, and it's more of a way of thinking than a set of tools, but it's come out of a number of different theoretical frameworks, such as AI, biology, economics, and law. The basic tenet is that it comes out of general systems theory, and it's an, an holistic approach to analysis that looks at whole systems based on links and interactions of the parts, the relationship of the parts to each other, and the environment within, the, within which those parts exist. General systems theory comes out of a guy called Berta Lanfe in 1969, and his approach allowed us, for the first time, to have a common theoretical perspective on diverse types of systems, such as a car engine, a human heart, and a school. Now, this was very, very left field in 1969. Even in 1999, using the word holistic, people looked at you a bit weird, like, you're a vegetarian. Like, what, what you, you know, is it something to do with bread? Um, 
But for, for us now, and in, in this room, we all sit here and we go, yeah, okay, I can understand that a car engine, a human heart, and a school are systems. And if I understand them as systems, in terms of their interaction of the component parts and the interaction with the environment within which they sit, I can perhaps understand some of the more complex, as opposed to complicated, emergent behaviours within those systems. And I wanted to throw this in. This comes out of information science, and it's a very, very important model. Shannon and Weaver's mathematical model of communication. All those systems have input, output, throughput, and feedback. And for me, as someone who came out of electronic arts, I, I, I am very comfortable with that. So we have input, output, throughput, and feedback in this mathematical model of communication. And of course, what human-centered systems of any kind have in common is that we all communicate with each other. That's how we behave as a system. We behave as a system by interacting with each other. So yes, we are even more important than we thought when we started this presentation. We are experts on how human beings interact with each other. This is the core mechanic for about how human beings behave. So broadly, systems thinking is a dialectical method that breaks with logical and causal analyses to emphasize relationships. And that's been touched on a number of times by previous speakers this morning. It can be traced from Socrates through Hegel to pragmatics, and it's a means of identifying systemic principles common to different systems from different perspectives. And pragmatics is really important. I'm a designer. I'm a pragmatist. I use what works. That's it. Over to what Jerry was saying earlier. So I'm a huge fan of pragmatics. Does it work? Does it not? As a designer, that's the sort of raison d'etre of everything we do. I was lucky enough about 15 years ago to get a job at the Open University in the Department of Design and Innovation. Only 25 staff, um, a quarter of them were pro professors. They were all a lot older than me, they were all men. There was only one other woman in the team, she was at entry level. So I was this sort of anomaly. They said, we thought we'd take a risk on you. And I'm glad they did, because I learned so much from hanging about with these people. Um, they, I was part of the Center for Complexity and Design. Now, we've talked this morning about whether d complexity can be predicted or managed or enabled. I'm a designer. My answer is yes. That's my job. It's my job to manage, predict, constrain, and enable outcomes. Where I put the handle on a door will impact on how somebody walks through that door successfully or not. A designer has to predict and manage emergent outcomes. So we used, they used uh, uh, Herbert Simon's uh, definition of design as science of the artificial, but they had this fantastic thing. I didn't know I was a master of complexity. <laughs> I just like making things. But I got to hang about with all these interdisciplinary practitioners who understood that designers manage complexity in a number of different ways all the time. Now, that quote, um, that doesn't even go into interaction design. So what we do is complex uh, to a higher degree, um, even more than that definition, because we let go of something. That door in our world changes every time somebody uses it. So how much change do we allow? Do we allow the users to move that door handle wherever they want it to be, and then it sits somewhere in the middle at the end? How much do we constrain and enable the interaction of the user? And that's absolutely core, as you know, to everything that we're trying to do. So what I came to understand is that some design systems are complicated, but they do not have hallmark features of complexity. And these are some of the people, and I'm a huge fan of the notion of standing on the shoulders of giants. Next time you want to search something, don't put it in Google, put it in Google Scholar. Because a lot of people, myself included, three days a week, we have a lot of time to think about things in a really narrow and deep way that you don't get when you're trying to save someone going to market with a block of flats. So I worked with George Rozevsky, who worked on the first uh, robots that went to Mars. Now, this for me was like sitting next to Mick Jagger. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> he worked on the robots that went to Mars. When I was a kid, I wanted to work for NASA. I wanted to be an actress that worked for NASA. So I just, I was, I was, <laughs> I'm nearly there, there's still time. Um, but I'm thinking, the, 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 the wealth of knowledge in, the, in these people and their practices, 
Um, Nigel Cross, who almost invented design research, he certainly start, helped start the Design Research Society, really interested in what design is as a serious practice. No offence, Lauren Llewellyn Bowen, but that's not what design is. Design is a technical um, craft. It's a very difficult craft. It's intuitive and analytical simultaneously. It's bloody fascinating. Nigel Cross um, was the head of school. I felt honoured to work under Nigel Cross. And people like Eve Middleton Kelly from the London School of Economics, who's an expert on complexity and policy, knowing the decisions that she makes in the EU, implementing the EU, regu EU directives, impacts on people's lives. So, if you're in charge of robots on Mars, or you're in charge of EU policy, you have to understand what complexity is. You have to start to understand what is going to emerge from the set of decisions that you're making. Right. So, systems theory stands in stark contrast to conventional science, which has been touched on this morning, based upon reductionism, which aims to analyse systems by reducing phenomena to its component parts. Reductionism is best understood in the natural sciences, which we all did at school, where you break something down, for example, matter, molecule, atom, nucleus. It's linear. You take something complex or complicated, and you aim to make it simple by cutting it into smaller and smaller pieces. What does that give us? It gives us pipelines. Management, communication, logistics, and production pipelines. They were quite useful for a while. It gives us top-down mass communications, where one piece of content is broadcast to an audience who don't interact and participate and send it back again. It gives us silos, the bane of my life. There are five departments in Brighton and Hove City Council who generate separate bills, one for your bin, one for your council tax, one for your parking. It's all coming out of one organisation. Silos, they're not helpful. And politically and socially, they're appalling. I won't even get onto that for the moment. It gives us linear business models. That's what reductionism gives us. We're at a point where we're moving from a rationalist, reductionist, manufacturing model of, of business into a connected, holistic, evolving, digital model of business. That's why half your clients won't listen to you. That's why they really want what you're doing. But when you tell them what it is, they, they're a bit, they balk at the notion. They won't let go of things. They don't want to know what the users want. They only want to do what they want because they're used to top down. I'm the boss, I want it blue. Well, all your users want it red. Well, I'm sorry, I'm the boss and I want it blue. All right, mate, you have it blue. Let's see what happens with your block of flats when you throw it off beachy head. So we're in a totally different situation <laughs> because of philosophical paradigms that actually construct the way we communicate. You know that, that, that pun, you can't say things that can't be said? That's actually true. Ideology constructs the language which gives, which gives us the frame within which we interact. We're at a point where those frames are changing. And personally, I believe the digital revolution is the biggest thing since the wheel or since fire, which I am now going to insist was designed and not discovered. So we're at a really important point. Convergence. Universities. I'm going off them. Is it business? Is it media? Is it computing? Is it design? It's all of them. The silos that is inhibiting intelligent practice in so many large organizations is not just detrimental to profit, it's detrimental to progress, to intellectual, emotional, and social progress. Those categories, those Cartesian divides across intellectual silos, Art going that way and science going that way are over. They believe me for a bit until things have to start to change. And then they'll think, oh, maybe we'll ignore her for another eight years and see what happens. That is what happens. Where's the nice lin there's your There's your nice linear business model, your pipeline, your top down, blah, blah, blah. That is where we're at. We're all all right with that, I assume, in this room. Unless we've got any interlopers. <laughs> I'm all right with flux. I'm all right with user-generated content. I'm all right with constant change. I've been comfortable with these things for a long time, which is actually just good fortune, but it's the core of my practice. Agile human-centered ecosystems that are in constant flux. You know who really doesn't like this? Ministry of Defense. <laughs> they will not believe me, 
that you can have a personalized vehicle. Soldiers under fire at the minute have to pull over in those open Jeep things that you see, and they've got three screens, and they have to stop to look at the screens. That is criminal. It is life-threatening. But will they believe me? You could have a personalized biometric thumbprint. You can have a co-evolving system that learns biometric data from how that soldier behaves under certain um, external circumstances, and the system will respond to that person. But the military don't like that. The military look a bit like that, don't they? They like it all in straight lines. So what I'm saying is we can manage complexity. We can design for flux. I love this. This is from something called We Media, a, a, pay, a PDF online, if you Google it, from about 1998. And they just took what had happened to journalism from the top-down model. Excuse me, whizzing backwards and forwards. The top-down model. This is signal transmission. This is technical fact. It's technical determinism. Loads of people don't like that. I'm not bothered. How does the tool work? That is what broadcast media does. And the social effects of that are what broadcast media does. That is what digital media does. And the social effects of that are what digital media does. There's a link between the material and the outcome. Like if a, if a designer had made these stairs out of jelly, it wouldn't work very well, would they? No. Form follows function, truth to materials. This was all hammered out in the Bauhaus in 1919. So we have to work with nonlinear ecosystems and agile uh, environments in constant flux. Companies that don't adapt find that digitals disrupt livelihoods, and markets, mar livelihoods, marketplaces, and economies. And I love that. That really upsets them because it looks like a virus attacking the front line of the workers. So we know what happens if you don't pivot. That shouldn't have happened. That's not rocket science. I mean, did Blockbuster think they were selling plastic bricks? Did they, nobody in that organization know that they were selling video content? Because that was a way down the line. That was a late, um, that, that, that's embarrassing. It's bad. <laughs> Is it not? If it had happened in 98 or something, you think, oh, all right, mate, it was a bit of a side swipe. So, but it didn't, did it? It's relatively recently, it's appalling. And I mean, this doesn't matter, but what if this is a hospital? What if this is patient records? What if it's MRI scans or something? That's digital content as well. So, you know, it doesn't matter here, but there are many, many, many situations where it really bloody matters. Like the soldiers with the three bloody screens they can't read, pulling over while they're under fire. So that's why design matters. So what are complex systems attributes? They are, and this is from Eve Middleton Kelly at London School of Economics in 2003, self-organization, and there's a posh word for it, autopoiesis, um, emergence, interdependence, feedback, space of possibilities, co-evolving, and the creation of new order. And this will be um, shared online later, because what I think is useful is to keep thinking of these attributes every time you're doing something. A convergent... Uh, a conver uh, I've forgotten it. Conversion rate. Um, conversion rates are unpredictable outcomes. Before you've designed your system, you're not going to be selling any shoes. So what you put in the middle between the desire to sell shoes and the selling of shoes is a complex system that creates a space of possibility within which desired emergent behaviors occur. Now, we know we get clustering and anomaly. We know we get people who don't. But in general, we try and, we've got agile development, we've got user testing, we try to iterate as we go along and include our users in our final products so that what goes live has the maximum opportunity of conversion rates. And we all know now we're not just working on selling shoes, are we? So there becomes much more ethical questions about what we're converting and what we don't. But you all already participate to some extent in designing complex systems. Not complicated systems complex systems with those attributes. 2007, I was lucky enough to be part of a, um, a converged research thing between um, Arts and Humanities Research Council and Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council as part of Designing for the 21st Century. 
um, the objective of embracing complexity in design was to start to understand the relationship between complexity science and design and the potential for design to play a major role in the emerging science of complex systems. So already, um, they were not designers who'd put this together, but they did work with Nigel Cross, but they'd started to understand how creative practice might enlighten complex system science. And we had a three-day event in Brighton, and we had mathematicians dancing the answers to their problems at the outside limit of our, our activities because mathematics cannot model complexity. I think I read on the internet the other day there's been recently some incremental breakthrough, which I can't detail. But um, generally speaking, maths can't model complexity. So that's the problem. Complexity is not linear. It's not that we can't model it. It's just that it's different. And it has unpredictable outcomes and it changes a lot. Okay. I'm working with a material that has unpredictable outcomes and changes a lot. I'll just account for that as best as I'm able. So it was really interesting to bring together loads of different people with loads of different methodologies to try and understand how we might learn from each other about how to model, apprehend, and design for complexity. Complex systems are generally diverse and made up of multiple interconnected elements. They're adaptive in the fact that they have the capacity to learn and change. The scientific study of complexity encompasses more, than, encompasses more than one theoretical framework and is highly interdisciplinary, but tries to seek some fundamental questions about living, adaptable, changeable systems. If you worked on a website recently that's not living, adaptable, or changeable, it ain't going anywhere. I'm assuming everyone in this room works, designs, works, and builds living, adaptable, changeable systems. So we do know, we do have things in place that we can start to understand about how complex systems behave. We had, like I said, we had all sorts of art. Can art generate new ideas and help solve problems? And this leads into that whole trench where you get resident artists in scientific establishments because they generate new insights because they have different ways of seeing things. But I won't go on about that now. One of the key issues for me is self-making, um, which is properly, properly known as autopoetics. And it comes from a guy called Lerman, and it's um, anything that remakes itself from its parts. Put your hand up if you are an organism that remakes itself from its parts. We all do. We're an autopoetic species. We are self-making. For him, he's a social scientist. He was talking about communication events, reproducing other communication events. Tell me if you can't think of an example in the recent history of world news where communication events haven't reproduced other communication events. For example, the Mohammed cartoons from uh, 2006, published by a Danish newspaper, which I've purposefully not reproduced because I work on global projects. <laughs> Duh. Did, did the Danish newspaper not know that they had a global network, or does it not matter? This is a highly political example, so I'm not even going to discuss it, but the point is, it matters because it has an effect. Ten years later, that cartoon issue was still rumbling along. Of course, it's massive clashes of ideologies and all the rest of it, but that demonstrates a complex system behavior. Any social scientist who worked with complexity could have told you that would have happened. In fact, lots of people with a bit of common sense could have told you that might happen. But anyway, there are a very serious side to us understanding how to design for emergent behaviors. That was not an unforeseen behavior. That could, that's a predictable emergent behavior across a digital mediated network. So I come at all this from the point of view that language, I love that quote, language is of the universe like galaxies and ecosystems, it participates in what it represents. We are a self-making species. Language is part of what we do. Interaction and communication is part of what we do. Our language itself, in whatever form it is, whether it's film, tweets, or whatever, ritual behavior, f fashion, the, all, the whole collateral of how we communicate is a, a complex system, and it mimics, it's bi biomimetic, it's self-making. And I've written all sorts of stuff about how Kangol headwear got readopted in the Bronx and, you know, the way memes travel across the world and things get reappropriated. I find it fascinating. 
So I'll whiz through this because it's not a little light reading. <laughs> I have written a lot on this, if anyone's interested. Um, I don't know if you're aware of uh, Derrida and post-structuralism and the notion of deconstructing the text. Well, I start to talk about reconstructing because we build things that facilitate interpretation and emergent behaviours. That's what we do. So I talk, started talking about reconstruction theory um, being a theoretical approach to a design methodology for creating a space of possibility in complex media. What's going to happen within that frame and how do you constrain and enable those behaviours for those users? I also talked about reality jamming and the way that we change what happens in the world by mediating and communicating things, which goes back to the uh, cartoons issue in a political sense. But I also looked at people like Michael Jackson. For me, there's evidence of a feedback loop there. The celebrity thing, um, the, and I'm not going to go there right now, <laughs> but there's, uh, if you bring a complex systems theory to look at the feedback loop between the representational system and what happens to the individual, that you can, there's, 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 there's perceivable evidence of non-linear causality between the representation and the real, which is actually what I'm really interested in. Um, the relationship between the sign and the signified, the simulation and the social, the model and the real. And that's what we're interested in, because we build sims, don't we? We build extrinsic simulations that we get people to participate in. And we try to design their behavior as a result of that participation. That's the book referring to that workshop, looking at the relationship between when you model something, again, what, how does the model relate to the actuality? Long story. And um, my, my sort of best strap line, I think, is the architecture of the image and the notion of a distributed image across time and space. And uh, the abstractions of synergetic brand architectures and designed identity systems creating a networked cloud semantics that soft engineers our behavior. And I do, I do do that, but I hope I do it ethically. And um, a semiotic systems approach to UX, um, saying the designer must successfully integrate visual communication design, information, information architecture, and usability. We know that. But by purposefully designing for semiotic autopoiesis. So it's the notion that there's a communicative self-making that's going to come out of what you design and build. And a fundamental dialectic between structure and function must be designed into the system and its use. You know that. You know the structure dictates the function, impacts on the behavior. So, a few sound bites. Good UX designers have to design dichronic grammatical structures. Yes, I'm a word fetishist. Um, that can adapt and evolve whilst consistently providing a coherent synchronic experience under multitudinous variables. I want, if I'm going to spend 400 quid on a pair of Jimmy Choo's, I don't want an Argos back end. That's what that means. Because <laughs> otherwise you've lost me and I'm not spending 400 quid on a pair of Jimmy Choo's. So good user experience design requires us to paint with language and leave it wet. I'll leave it at that, I think. So have I got any time left? I've got no idea how to measure things. Okay, yeah, okay, all right. So designing complexity. I struck my neck out, didn't I? I said, I design for complexity. What do I do? I do a dive, but it's a complex dive. I like the notion of complex nested systems because it allows you to look at, at the widest macro and the tiniest micro interdependencies right across all the correlated stakeholders and legacies. So I look at the whole nested system, for example, brand, company, marketplace, product, service, and value chain. I look at your employees, clients, prospects, and shareholders, because I don't do users, I do stakeholders, because very often there's all sorts of uh, stakeholders involved in these things that you might not have presupposed. I look at context, deployment, and situations. How does it pan out in deployment in micro and macro contexts, including legal, geographical, social, and technical? About three years ago, I kept saying Uber's really bad, and it was a bit like saying the king's got no clothes or something. I said, Uber's not been designed for deployment. It's going to come into loads of problems. It's been designed on a desktop for a desktop. And lots of people who are not in digital were going, no, Uber's the great new disruptor. I'm buying shares. It's like, I don't care. I care about design. That was not designed for deployment. Look at your stakeholders in the London marketplace. Get the black cabbies as a partner. Duh. Is that a duh moment? You know, I mean, how long have they been there? 
the historical legacy, how important they are to the tourists. They completely, completely missed it. So for me, I like to look at the whole socio-cultural context within which I'm designing and to work out what, where the traction lies. Complex mapping. Existing behaviours, both socio-cultural and digital, such as in communications in a large organisation. People may manually take minutes. Don't give them all iPads because they're not going to like it and it won't work and it'll hinder the transformation. You know, um, trying to capture what needs to be transformed from that culture, what, wherever that culture sits. Human beings are attached to nonsensical processes and artifacts for no fucking reason. But it works. That's what drives us. That's how we, that's our, our engine oil. So um, also looking at stakeholders, review and modeling complex relationships. Sometimes that's between staff, managers, shareholders, partners, investors, collaborators, clients, and prospects. But all this can be done if you look at it as a complex nested system with interdependencies and understand it's going to co-evolve. A holistic review of micro and macro dependencies, which has got nothing to do with baking bread, um, but the butterfly effect. What happens on a tiny scale? How's that going to impact right across the medium scale and the macro scale? Especially if you're working in different locales. If you're working, for example, in Saudi and Denmark. How about that? Micros and macros. Current and future opportunities and threats from across the marketplace. Um, looking at isolating potential for dynamic change. Dynamic change is something you can harness, but it's also obviously something that can potentially be a threat. Looking at strengths and weaknesses of competitors, we all do that. And the aims and functionalities of all the touch points, current and future touch points, internal, external, micro and macro, and how do they perform, and how do they all bump into each other or not. So, really useful concept for me, designing the space of possibility. Isolate the opportunities for change, socio-cultural and technical, because it's embedded. Um, I make recommendations on embedded engage, engagement and motivation because if you want people to do things, we all know you've got to motivate them, which means you've got to engage them emotionally, you've got to get them involved in a story, storytelling, different cultures, different stories. Don't get the story right, nobody does anything, and you've built a block of flats. Splash into the sea again. Take an agile, quick and dirty approach to picking up on the most dynamic points for quick and yet strategic wins. You can't approach a massive human-centered system and think, I'm going to do a massive uh, requirements re review or something. You've got to be able to look at the whole thing, observe where things are fluctuating and where there are points of change, and link together those points of change. And that's how you scale. A lot of this I can't even communicate, actually. I can do. <laughs> so it's not quite a book I can write and a methodology I can flog. Um, anyway, and design a, a bespoke digital intervention feedback loop. You can intervene wherever you want to create change. You can intervene with a bit of digital and you can nudge the, the evolution that you want to uh, nudge, actually. So what am I doing now? Why does all that matter? I'm working on the notion of uh, user experience in uh, three dimensions for Internet of Things, AR and VR. I've actually worked on what used to be called uh, pervasive and embedded systems a long time ago, and I've also worked in immersive, I think the time before last or something, you know, it keeps coming back. Um, but what's happening now is we've got a lot of processing power, so we're likely to be able to go a lot further with it. This is um, a, a, a diagram of the Internet of Things. It's nested complexity. So on the outside, you've got your internet cloud and servers, and the end point apparently is the thing all right, what's the end point? Is it the thing? It's the fucking user. There's no user in it again. So how are we going to start to move through a complex environment of embedded, pervasive computing systems when everything that's going on still doesn't have the user in it? The end point is not the thing. That's not the end point. We are the end point. So, and we interact with all that by means of an interface, whether it's a wooden handle on the box or whether it's what the rest of us uh, in here commonly understand as an interface. There's an interface and then there's a user. There's not just a world of things over my dead body. Am I work I'm walking through a world of autonomous decision-making things. That is not happening. 
So what I'm working on is real-time connected and responsive feedback loops driven by intelligent architectures so that those stupid things bow down to my human dictatorship and only deliver me what I want delivering, when I want it delivering, in an intelligent way. So it, my research for a long time has been about closing the semantic gap between computers and people, so it's still all that. So it's not even that, is it? It's that. So I'm sorry I'm messing up everybody's drawings, but somebody's going to have to tell somebody that it's not like that and it doesn't end on the thing. That's in it, and it goes like that. And this, for me, I'm not going to even tell you what's in those rings because I'm in negotiations with some very large players. <laughs> but at the back of the user experience is human motives. Are we safe? Are we happy? Do we feel um, comfortable? I worked on a job for a government in Southeast Asia who do all their transactions in cash. So let's say, for example, for some unforeseen reason, they could no longer transact in cash, and they're un those people are under duress. You need to allow those people to feel they are transacting in cash. So you don't turn it into Bitcoin, cherry, chocolate, gamified nobos. You make it look like cash. People like continuity. We are, we're emotional beings. The all answers to all this are actually really simple. And that brings me on to the last book chapter I wrote was about value mechanics. How do you work out what's important to people, what you need to retain, what you need to capture? We all know Spotify and Netflix went to market and because everyone could get everything, nobody wanted anything. I love that. <laughs> that tells us everything we need to know about people. There was no value to any of that. There was no hunting around a record shop for that red vinyl. All that had gone. So for me, if I'm, if I'm digitally transforming the music marketplace, I'm modeling the red vinyl mechanic. There needs to be ac you know, limited access, valuable access to some sort of bootleg or something somewhere, or you've knackered your whole value chain. So that's me. I'm on LinkedIn, if anyone wants to con continue these ludicrous debates. And I'm also speaking at gamification. I'm going to tell Octalysis that they've bankrupted their own methodology, if anyone wants to come and see me do that. <laughs> Thank you.